Hotel. My name is Malafi Kati Asante, and I'm very happy to introduce uh, you, actually, uh, to this institution, if you have not been here before. Uh, this is the Malefic Eti Asante Institute for Afrocentric Studies, uh, and we are a think tank. We are actually uh, a non-government, uh, 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 private, independent, uh, nonpartisan organization where we discuss all issues related to the African world. So we are just really delighted that you have come and those of you who are on live stream around the world, especially Brother Mutu, we want to say thank you uh, for uh, being here uh, all the way uh, from Paris, and those of you who are in Australia who also follow us. So uh, this is a wonderful occasion. I just want to make uh, just uh, two or three announcements before I introduce the speaker today. Uh, our next presentation here uh, at the MKA Institute uh, will be uh, on April the 14th. On April the 14th, the uh, outstanding scholar, Dr. Patricia Reed Merritt, who is a distinguished professor at Stockton University, will be talking about uh, actually um, really uh, women warriors uh, from uh, Fannie Lou Hamer to Letitia James. And I'm sure she's going to be talking about uh, Fannie, uh, Fannie as well. Uh, she will be um, here. Uh, she is, of course, uh, one of the outstanding uh, scholars on race in this country, having written uh, two or three of the most significant books, I believe, in that area. Uh, then we will have on April the 28th, uh, Dr. Joyce King from Georgia State University about the future of education in this country. Uh, she will be here speaking for us. Now, in the meantime, perhaps before that time, we have um, a, a wonderful treat for you. Uh, uh, Anna and I are still working out the particulars for it and the date, but we think it'll be a Friday or a Saturday when we have the Philadelphia debut of the outstanding film. If you have not seen it, and most people in the U.S., I think, have not seen it, uh, it's a film on um, the great Mangaliso Sobukwe, uh, A Great Soul. It's called A Great Soul. We will have the Philadelphia debut of Sobukwe, A Great Soul, uh, this film, which uh, I saw about a week ago, a little more than a week ago, uh, in Camden. Uh, we will have the Philadelphia debut of the film uh, in the next three or uh, four weeks. But we will let you, we'll send you information, let you know exactly when uh, this film will make its debut here in the city of Philadelphia. And it will be right here. We'll have the showing here and have a conversation. Uh, Sobukwe, as you know, was uh, perhaps the most charismatic leader uh, of the uh, freedom movement in Azania in South Africa. And uh, in, in, in fact, we, will, uh, we look forward uh, to having a conversation about him in relationship to uh, even uh, the ANC leader, uh, Nelson Mandela. Uh, he was the leader, Subukwe was the leader of the PAC, uh, the Pan-Africanist Congress. And uh, one of the things that we know is that during the apartheid regime, uh, the regime feared um, Mangaliso more than they did Mandela. And the reason for it was because he was insistent on the idea that uh, Azania belonged uh, to the people of Azania. And this was a, a very different uh, tone that, uh, uh, than the one that had been taken by most of the Marxists. And so he had uh, a very strong opinion. He was very clear as a person who believed in human dignity and he felt like the dignity of all Africans had to be respected. 
So we will have uh, certainly question and answer, but it, the film is about, it seems like about two hours. Mm -hmm. So uh, we may not have too many questions and answers, but we certainly will have time for you to discuss some of the things about this film. So, so look forward to that. Uh, I also uh, want to say, if you have not received, uh, some of you may have received the poem uh, that will be uh, really uh, discussed, or two of the poems that will be discussed today. If you haven't received them, I think there are some that you can get from uh, Anna at the counter. We, we welcome you. And we um, also just want to give a shout out to uh, the brothers and sisters in South Africa who are on live stream. I know uh, Dr. Simpiwe uh, Sisanti, who's spoken here, and Dr. Lee Hassa Malloy and other people. Uh, they are, of course, uh, they have received uh, Dr. Nadav uh, this week, and we, we want them to all give her uh, our uh, great thanks for the work that she has done here. Now for what we will do today. I am so happy I got a chance to uh, meet uh, Yesenia Escobar uh, um, Espita, uh, who is an Afro-Colombian professor, writer, uh, a lawyer, uh, born and raised in Barranquilla, uh, Colombia. She earned a bachelor's degree in modern languages from the University of Atlantico and a law degree from the University of La Grande, Colombia. She holds a master's degree in literary studies from the National University of Colombia with a dissertation on Afro-Colombian writers, uh, Candelario Obeso and Jorge Artel. Nowadays, she's a PhD candidate in the Spanish department at Temple University. Her research interests focus on Afro-Latin American literature emphasizing women writers from Brazil, Colombia, and the Caribbean. She is co-author of the chapter entitled Writing and Activism, a Political Perspective of Afro-Latino Struggle in Colombia, Brazil, and the Caribbean that has been published in Afro-Latinas and Latin Negros Culture, Identity, and Struggle uh, from an Intersectional Perspective. Uh, she, she's, in, in fact, a very strong published uh, writer, creative writer. Uh, her works uh, include uh, Esueno Negro del Africa Mia, a Black Daydream of My Africa, a poetry book, and two children's literature books. Um, uh, she, she is also an active member of Red El Elegua, a Colombian NGO interested in researching and fostering anti-racist education based on studying Africa and the African diaspora. She has been twice invited to become a part of A Voice for Peace, Concord and Harmony, the International Poetry Festival in Philadelphia organized by Action Colombia, Philadelphia Free Library and the Department of Spanish and Portuguese at Temple. Uh, I could say more about um, uh, her, I can give you more about her history, but let me just tell you this, that what I am most uh, proud of is that she has been a very active member of the intellectual community here in Philadelphia. Uh, we have uh, seen her in many uh, venues at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, also, I think this may be the second time that we've had her speak here at the MKA Institute. Uh, she's well loved and well known uh, in our community. And so I am pleased and happy to present to you, those of you who have not known her, uh, Yesenia. Yesenia, will you come? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well. Thank you so much, Professor Molefi. Thank you to all of you for coming here to listen to my talk. I hope you enjoy it. And well, I'm gonna start by reading what I prepared for you, my, 
presentation, Afro-Colombian literature, how Africans see the world in Colombia. I know that some people in Colombia is following me now in the channel, and I want to say hello. I hope to see you soon. <laughs> and thank you for being here, even virtually. Well, I know you're expecting to start my lecture talking about words, but I will start talking about numbers. Why numbers? Because numbers also can tell us a story. According to global rankings, Colombia is the fifth country in the world with the largest Afri African descendant population. It means that in South America, we have the second largest population after Brazil. This is important to mention because nowadays, there, is, there are still people who think that uh, about Colombians, like those characters of narco series, and they even don't imagine that there are black people in Colombia. When we look at the maps, well, and then uh, the, the, the slide show you the list of the 10 countries with the largest population. Then you can see that the first one is Brazil, the second one, United States, the third, Haiti, Dominican Republic, and then Colombia, and then the other ones. Okay, but then let's see the maps. And sorry, okay. If you, uh, when we look at the maps, you will find Colombia there, yes, located on the northwestern corner of South America, based by the waters of the Caribbean Sea and the Pacific Ocean. Yes, the second map over there um, shows you the well, distribution of most African descendant people in Colombia. However, despite, um, it is a fact that as is shown in the map, most African descendant people in Colombia is located on the Pacific coast. It's not true that the, there are so few in the rest of the country. So the, the first thing that I want to hi highlight is that even though in the map, according to statistics, is that most people or African people is in, in are on, on the Pacific coast, it doesn't mean that in the rest of the country there are not more black people. There are African people everywhere in Colombia. So when we look at the next slide, you can see three important facts that are going to introduce my topic. First, we are divided into three different groups. Yes, I mean black or Afro-Colombians. Raizal, it's African descendant people from San Andres, Providencia, and Santa, Santa Catalina Island, who speak a Creole language. And Palenquero, yes, it's African descendant people from Palenque de San Basilio, a former Maroon town, who speak uh, Palenquero, is a Bantu based language mixed with Spanish. Okay, and then that's the first thing you see, no? The ethnic group. I mean, this Africa or Afri Afro descendant people in Colombia is divided into three groups. Mm -hmm. Yes, and also we have the different census. Yes, is um, the um, those is, uh, issues by the agency in charge of the population census in Colombia. Then you will see that according to the D A N E, the African descendant population in two thousand five was uh, four million three hundred eleven seven hundred. Uh, 57, it means 10.62% of the population in comparison to 2018 when it became 2,982,200 uh, in 2024. It means 6.76% uh, of the population. These numbers take us to the third fact. Yes, there is a narration about a hypothetical reduction of our population in Colombia. Why is that possible? Because in Colombia, as in many other countries, people recognize themselves as part of a particular ethnic group. And because of the remnants of colonialism and the caste system, the caste system, many people of African descent, especially those with less dark skin, don't self-identify with the ethnic group to which they belong. As you will see in the following slide, yes, um, both maps show the location of African descent pe descendant people censored both in 2005 and 2018. In the map on the right, you can see the areas in which there was the largest 
the greatest reduction or variation in the census population figures. Unfortunately, the Caribbean region where I come from and where I know there is a very high population of African descendants was one of the regions with the greatest population reduction. As you already know, all these numbers have a great impact on official budget for attending needs of our people. But the deepest impact is in the narrative created around those numbers for those who try to make us disappear from the historical, political, social, cultural, and any other scenarios where definitely we have a place and something to tell. So considering that, as we have seen, neither history or official statistics define who we are or we must define ourselves. This is where literature plays a crucial role, not only in understanding our stories, but also in setting a precedent before the war, demonstrating that our stories matter too. And then I take a, this phrase of Toni Morrison. As Toni Morrison said, books are a for a political action. Books are knowledge. Books are reflection. Books change your mind. Okay, so now I can set aside the numbers and, bega and begin to speak about words. So basically what I was trying to say is that this nar narrative created by those numbers that say that we are reducing our people, it's just the product of the way that sometimes um, consider yourself as a black person in a context where black person, black people have like a, like less opportunities yeah, don't let the, the people that really recognize themselves as black, yeah. Well, and w let's talk about what, the, why it's important then to talk about books then. And then let's introduce Afro-Colombian literature. Um, in ancient Egypt, we have a word, heka, yes, the meant magical power. The Egyptians believed that Heka was the primordial force present in, at the creation of the world. For Bantu people, Nomo identifies the power of the world to generate and create reality. Those concepts led us to the idea that words not only describe our realities, but create them and shape them. When talking about Afro-Colombian literature, there is a long story about how we have built our culture but also contributed to the Colombian, Latin American, and world society in general. As Milan Kundera pointed out, literature creates the existential memory of an entire community, and that's what our authors have done. Then you can see uh, in, the, in, the, in this slide, for instance, well, perhaps you didn't know how many Afro-descendant authors we had in Colombia. Yes, there are more than 100. I just got some of them. P perhaps uh, what are more recognized or visible. Yes, and then you have, for instance, Candelario Obeso, Jorge Artel, Manuel Zapata Oliveira. I'm going to talk about them later. This is Edelma Zapata. Edelma Zapata is uh, Manuel Zapata Oliveira's daughter. And then we have Romulo Bustos, Miriam Diaz. I'm going to talk about her. Ma, eh, eh, Teresa Martinez de Varela, Arnoldo Palacio, Mari Grueso, Alfredo Banin, eh, Adelaida Fernández Ochoa, Oscar Collazos, eh, Fanny, eh, I forgot, uh, Maria Lu Pozo Figueroa. And then we have Colombia, Sonia, and Yvonne America Truque Vélez. They are, the, they are daughters of Carlos Arturo Truque, who's another writer, Miguel A. Caicedo, and Hazel Robinson. Yes, and those are just a few authors, yes, in the, well, of the richest, you know, authors that we have in, in Colombia, uh, in the landscape of Afro-Colombian literature. But, uh, but this is like a, this, the history of modern and contemporary uh, literature. But the, our story be, be, began, or oh, began, yes, before. Dr. Alain Lawosukan, an associate professor of Hispanic and African, African Studies and coordinator of African Studies program at Texas A&M University, asserts that in the literary realm, 
Afro-Colombian verse is not recent but dates to the era of slavery. Enslaved Africans resorted to poetry and oral chants to safeguard historical memory. African culture alleviate daily hardships and challenge the joke of oppression. In the 19th century, the figure of the black person as a secondary character appears in numerous work written by Colombians of European descent, such as Eustachio Palacios, Tomás Carrasquilla, and Jorge Sachs. It was until the dawn of the Republic that Afro-Colombian written literature entered the world of national letters. However, its presence has been ignored and silenced by the dominant discourse until the mid-20th century, when some anthropologists, ethnographers, and literary critics, such as Rogelio Velázquez, Nina Friedman, Peter Wade, Norma Whitten, Richard Jackson, Lawrence Prescott, and Marvin Lewis, dedicate themselves to researching Afro-Colombian culture. Indeed, when I approached the first known book of history of Colombian literature entitled Historia de la Literatura de la Nueva Granada by Jose Maria Vergara y Vergara, he introduces in the chapter 18 what he called literatura popular, folk literature. He introduces his chapter by saying, the pages greetings, written so far have been dedicated solely to discussing the development of literature in the educated class of society. I have reserved for the last place the examination of our very poor popular poetry, poor in comparison to the poetry of the same genre in Spain, but which considered in abstract doesn't fail to have interesting faces and demonstrates some intellectual richness in the lower, cla the lower cl classes of Nueva Granada or New Granada. Obviously, he considered by that time, yes, that the history of our literature presupposes knowledge of Spanish literature, particularly at the time when ours, when ours diverged from its glories and our literary works separated from theirs. So in addition to this, he emphasizes the black people sang quietly songs that the indigenous person did not repeat and vice versa. The white person sang their ballads Val ballads, I think so, <laughs> and verses that the indigenous and black people only partially repeated, scarcely in those aspects where they found situations analogous to their own feelings or an understand understandable expression of the emotions and passions common to all humans. Not having a previous history of their own in the, in the country where they gather, these heterogeneous people could not popularize poetry. Many generations needed to pass for the black person to forget their homeland and love this one. For the indigenous person to be accustom accustomed to seeing themselves as compatriots of the white and black people, and for the white person to completely forget the Spani their Spanish homeland and have memories of our American ancestors. When, by the passage of time, memories were on unif a fire, and there was a common homeland and history, another inconvenience remained, racial antipathy. To eliminate this obstacle and for the three races to absorb each other, exchanging and taking on qualities, forming on ra one race, and finally uniting their memories in one past, another great period it's necessary. So what this uh, man did, uh, Jose Maria Vergara Vergara, who was the writer of the first, the first history of um, co Colombian literature, he recognized that there was uh, like a popular of folk literature that is was the all the chants and um, rhymes produced by African people and also both but peasants and uh, native people. Yes, but it was not considered, you know, educated people, for instance, and for that reason, it's not literature, but it's, but he, he said that it's some kind of intellectual trace, yes, in those, uh, well, rhymes. And in, he insists also in the necessity of mixture, you know, our races in order to unify, to, to consider this uh, idea of the, the mestizaje, you, I don't know, you know, like the mestizo race where we are part uh, of, a, or, or we are a combination of races, no, and no particular races. 
that you know it's a it's a very romantic idea but at the same time eliminate many things about our our roots yeah well unfortunately that's the history of our ancestors taught to us in our schools and even today part of this narrative remains that's why when we approach the 19th century and we read the canonic authors we find for instance jorge Sachs and his novel maria yeah but we don't know about Candelario Oveso and his popular Sons of My Native Land. Maria was written between 1864 and 1867. It's a costumbrist novel representative of the Spanish Romantic movement. It may be considered as precursor of, of the curious novels of the 1920s and 1930s in Latin America. The novel has several autobiographical elements, such as both main characters being natives of Valle del Cauca or Efrain's departure to Bogota to pursue his studies. It has been claimed that Maria herself is based at least in part upon a cousin of the author. The Hacienda del Paraíso and its, its large slave population both own by Isaac's family also figures largely throughout the novel. The location is currently preserved as a museum. It is striking that this novel is recognized for narrating the idyllic and tragic love of Maria and Ephraim, but other significant aspects of the novel are overlooked, describing them as pictorial, pictori pictorial or landscape-like. For exa example, the inclusion of the story of Nai and Sinar in the chapters uh, 40 to uh, 43, who were two enslaved African princes. The narrative not only reveals the past of these characters, but also the pain and tragedy of enslavement, thus deconstructing the inhuman nature of slavery. Moreover, Moreover, considering the religious faith of the novel's character, this story also highlights the anti-Christian nature of slavery and the profound, the profound remorse in the Judeo-Christian sense of guilt that it generates in Ephraim's family due to their slave-holding status, even when the treatment they give to the slave is paternalistic. Well, so what we can see is that Maria is recognized more for the uh, story of the white people who are protagonists of the story, but they forget a very important chapter about two enslaved people who were in the farm. Yes, well, fortunately, these characters serve as an inspiration for the writer Adelaida Fernandez Ochoa to develop her novel La Hoguera Lame Mi Piel Con Cariño de Perro, published under the title Afuera Crece Un Mundo, uh, by Sex Barra, which earned her the Casa de las Americas Award in 2015. Adelaida, from an Afrocentric perspective, made Nai a central character in her novel, giving her agency and protagonism. To rectify the system way the voices of black women in foundational literature were omitted or silenced. But returning or, go, or going back to Maria, the novel also includes within this its romantic description of the landscape, some of the verses sung by the bold men of the Magdalena, while for critics these inclusions are plausible in Isaac's world. They were devalued in Candelario Obeso, the, Obeso, the first black poet of Colombia, who dedicated an entire book to foregrounding the experiences, feelings, and concerns of the Afro-descendant community in Colombia. But above all, to break with the format of the so-called co culture Spanish language, incorporating the phonetics of the dialect specific to the bold man into the writing of his poetry. Well, I will go over Candelario Beso, but I, I wanted to figure out with this introduction is that Afro-Colombian literature had this, has been present since colonial times because African people refused to forget their history, their identity, their culture, their knowledge, and they used, and they used all resources at hand, at hand to preserve their legacy to their descendants. And their descendants also have not only saved the, these memories but enriched them by incorporating their voices into their new stories. 
So however, the major problem faced by academics and attempting to address Afro-Colombian literature is the lack of a solid framework proposing a theory for the analysis of Afro-Colombian literature. Moreover, there is a dearth of comprehensive his his histori historiography and literary criticism, both old and recent, to construct a handbook to navigate and inspire new studies in this field. Now stops with the critics, and let's focus on knowing some of the most relevant writers of Afro-Colombian literature. I must say first that there are more than 100 recognized authors, as I said at the beginning, in Afro-Colombian literature, including the contemporary. So I apologize because I will mention just some of them. And your homework will be to find the others. <laughs> so let's start by Candelario Obeso, OK? Candelario Obeso, poet of Magdalena. Uh, he was born in 1849. Uh, and he died in, he, he, he was born before that slavery was abolished in Colombia because the slavery was abolished in 1851, yes. So he, he was born two years before uh, the slavery, uh, uh, slavery, but he was a mulatto. So, and he, he, he was born from a um, free mother. So for that reason, he was just a, 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 a free, free man. So he was a Colombian poet and is known as the precursor of the poesia negra or black and dark poetry in Colombia. Yeah, and liter his, his literary style focused on describing the daily activities performed by Colombian black communities. He wrote his narrative in the first person and that was very important because um, when I was mentioning Jorge Isaacs, uh, and also the other authors in the 19th century who used or who, who used to describe black communities, they he, they were all the time using third person. Yeah, I mean describing what people, what black people felt, what what people did, what what they thought. But Candelario Beso used the first person to yes to talk about the protagonists of uh, the characters. Well, uh, an example of this is his first book of poems, Cantos Populares de mi Tierra, published by Imprenta de Borda in 1887. He also wrote La Familia Pigmalión, eh, Lectura para ti, Secundino el Zapatero, and Lucha de la Vida. He translated into Spanish Shakespeare's Othello and words from Victor Hugo, Byron, Mus Musset, eh, Longfellow, Get and jo Jonathan Lawrence. So he was really a brilliant writer, and also he was diplomatic, and he was military uh, and translator. He was a very um, important person in, here in his community, but he was not in the literary community in Bogota. That was most the city where he was most of the or live more, most of his life. Well, to talk about one of his most famous poems, in order that you understand what I was mentioning uh, before about the phonetics uh, that he used in order to break with the language, I brought this video, Song of Abs and Boga. Then you have the poem, yes, in a uh, printed, and then you have the, the, the meaning of the different words like boga, sambo, mapana, yeah, and the and then you have you can find the point in Spanish, in English, yes, and also the dialect. That is what you're gonna hear.
dentro del alma mía mientras yo brego en la mar bañado en suror por ella ¿Qué hará? ¿Qué hará? Tal vez por su samba mao, doliente suspirará. O tal vez ni me recuerda llorar. Chora. Qué triste que está la noche, la noche que ocurre está. La sembra. Son como todo lo de esta tierra en gracia. Con arte se saca el pez del mar. Del mar. Con arte se ablanda el hierro. Se roma la mapaná. Constante y firme es la pena. No hay más. No hay más. Yo... I hope you have enjoyed the poem. Yeah, it was the, on the voice of um, Leonor González Mina. It's like La Negra Grande de Colombia. is a very famous uh, Afro-Colombian singer, too. Uh, and she has a very beautiful voice. I, if you understood the poem, it's a very uh, sad poem, yeah? But at the same time, it's deep, no? The feeling about this man who's going to work, uh, and perhaps he doesn't know if he's going to to come back. Yes, and he is thinking what is going, what is going on with the family. Meanwhile, he's out uh, in the night. Well, another writer is Agapito de Arco. Yes. Uh, Now, also known as Jorge Artel, yes, who was a journalist, novelist, and critic, yes, and he was recognized because he stood out for uh, the exaltation of the values of black ethnic community people, yes, and the feelings and way of life of the Caribbean people, yes. Um, what I recognize about uh, Jorge Artel is that, well, given He was like um, he lived in the in the moment that negative uh, movement was uh, present, yeah, and he claimed himself as the poeta de la negritud in Colombia, like the black poet mm -hmm. in Colombia. But unfortunately, in Colombia by that time, um, well, literary criticism didn't care too much about. Uh, Negritude or Jorge Atel because we had our own movement that it was uh, Generación Piedra y Cielo and also Los Nuevos. And if you look for the critics on the history of uh, uh, Colombian li uh, literature or poetry, uh, those movements are 
who take, took the attention of the critics by that time, and know uh, Jorge Artel. The, it was thanks to Lawrence Prescott who did he, uh, his research about uh, Jorge Artel in his book, Without Hatred or Fears, Jorge Artel, Artel and the Struggle for Black Literary Expression in Colombia, when his work was, uh, uh, well, like uh, attended by the critics uh, in Colombia again. And, and then one of the f famous poems written by Jorge Artel was Tambores en la Noche. It's also a beautiful poem that I brought for you today. And the, the poem is also printed here. Yes, you have the English version. I don't know if the translation was right, but uh, I hope that you understand what is the point about. Tambores en la noche. Jorge Artel. Los tambores en la noche parece que siguieran nuestros pasos. Tambores que suenan como fatigados en los sombríos rincones portuarios, en los bares oscuros, aquelárricos, donde ceñudos lobos se fuman las horas, plasmando en sus pupilas un confuso motivo de rutas perdidas, de banderas y mástiles y proas. Los tambores en la noche son como un grito humano, Trémulos de música les han oído gemir cuando esos hombres que llevan la emoción en las manos les arrancan la angustia de una oscura saudade, de una íntima añoranza, donde vigila el alma dulcemente salvaje de mi vibrante raza, con sus siglos mojados en quejumbres de gaitas. Tambores misteriosos que resuenan en las enramadas de rudos boteos, aconsonando el golpe con los cantos de los decimeros, con el grito blasfemo y algazara, con los juramentos de los marineros, en tanto que se anuncia, tras los gibosos montes, un caprichoso recorte de mañana. Los tambores en la noche hablan, y en su voz, una llamada tan honda, tan fuerte y clara, que parece como si fueran sonándonos en el alma. Okay, do you like it? <laughs> yeah, it's a beautiful point too. I love I love uh, Candelario Beso on, on Jorge Artel. And well, if you check the well the poem, he talks also not only about the the, the drums that are very important in, in African communities, but also about the back, backpipe, I don't know if I'm pronouncing very well. Yeah. It's a guy that, that is a, it's an, um, musical instrument from, um, native people, yes, for in, in Colombia. Yes. Uh, so I mean, what we call indigenous people. Yes. And they, uh, when, when, if you remember when I was talking about the history of, uh, Nueva Granada, the literature of Nueva Granada, the author said that like uh, indigenous and black people like uh, lived together, but they were like separated at the same time. But what Jorge Artel is showing here is that it's not like that. I mean, it's black and uh, African descendant people and also indigenous people have lived together and have shared many things in common the whole lives, I mean, in Colombia, you know? You know? And that's what, what Jorge Artel does in his poem, and I think that it's, it's amazing. The other author, I'm not going to talk about all of them, so just an, uh, a few of them, and I'm, going, I'm not going to read all the, the biography, but so I'm going to just to mention some important things. The other one is Manuel Zapata Olivella, who was born in Lorica. We have someone here from Lorica. <laughs> Yeah, she was born in the same uh, hometown. Yes, and he's uh, author of several books, uh, especially Chango el Gran Putas, Chango the Great Badass, 
And he was a very awarded uh, writer. He was a he works as a physician and a psychiatrist because he studied uh, medicine in in Bogota. He was he also tried to be an anthropologist. And he was a writer. He was he did a lot of stuff, sociologists. And he he was moreover one of the first to introduce Bantu philosophy in his essays and to show us a path to connect with African history. So I mean when I before coming to the United States, I didn't know anything about Afrocentric perspective. I learned about this here. But when I study or I started learning about Afrocentric perspective, I was all the time remembering Manuel Zapata Oliveira. He never talked about Afrocentric perspective or paradigm, but he was very Afrocentric in the way, in his work, especially in his essays and in his novel, Chango el Gran Put as well. He introduced all the cosmogony of the Orishas mm -hmm. and explained like uh, all the philosophy behind the Bantu, well, the Bantu Amuntu, yes, uh, philosophy. And, and also Yoruba, well, he was, and uh, what I want to say also is that he was not like a, lo a long wolf either, because with his brother Juan, who was also a writer, and his sister Delia, who was a dancer, they joined other descendant artists and activists to generate an enti entire political movement against racism and the invisibility of Afro-descendant intellectuals. They were the first people to organize La Marcha Negra in Bogota. So, I mean, it was the first movement who, go, uh, how do you say marcha? Who can remember? March in Spanish, in English? Well, the first march of Afro descendant in Colombia was organized by Manuel Zapata Olivella with other intellectual in Bogota. Uh, when there was also the, this, the movement, this, the, the civil rights movement in, in United States, because he was he came to the United States and was connected with, with this movement. He also went to Africa and was connected with Pan, -Afri Pan Africanism. He traveled a lot, yes, and all what he got in his trips, uh, when when he went back to Colombia, he um, was trying to teach and to transmit all the knowledge he was getting out of Colombia. Yeah, well. The other, well, the, the writers that I mentioned before, I mean, Jorge Artel, Candelario Beso, and Zapata Olivella, they are from the Caribbean coast. But we have also the Pacific coast. Yes, some people think that uh, just there are writers in one coast or because perhaps some of them are very famous, but no, we have a lot of people uh, in the Pacific coast that are also recognized outside Yes, and in Colombia. And one of them is Teresa Martinez de Varela. She, she, is, she was the first, the first um, woman, or black woman writer in Colombia. She was born in 1913, and she died in 1998. And it's very curious that she was known because she was the, ma the mother of Jairo Varela, who was the founder of a salsa group named Grupo Nietzsche. And everybody knows who was Nietzsche and knows uh, her as the, the mother of Jairo, Jairo Barrera's mother, but know her as a writer. Yes, and it was, it's important to mention that it's just, she was rediscovered in, 20, in 2009 nine, when Ursula Mena de Lozano, I don't know if she's uh, watching the, 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 or following me at this moment in, the, in, in Colombia, uh, but thanks for doing, for doing it. Yes, some of her works were collected in an anthology published by the Ministry of Culture in 2018. 2010, 2010, please, sorry. She is now regarded as one of the pioneering voices to bring African identity in Colombia into the literary landscape of the country and one of the primary intellectuals of her era. Yes, so, well, that's Teresa Martinez de Varela, the other one. Well, I mentioned that, uh, that Carlos Arturo Truque, yes, was a very important storyteller. Yes, he was born in 1927 
and he died in 1970. And as I mentioned before, he was very, very important, not only for being a, a recognized and awarded writer, but, because, but also because his daughters are, have been also extraordinary and award winning poets. Yes, and well, I mean, those who we are talking about, a family of intellectual brought great prestige to Colombian literature. And it's a shame that Carlos Arturo Truque is one of the Afro-Colombian writers less studied, less analyzed in Colombia. And, and not only him, but also his daughters, yes. When Ivon, Ivon America, Colombia and Sonia, they live in Colombia, and I know that Colombia is connected online, and I want to say hello, and thanks for all what you have been doing. But, and also I know that Ivon America Truque, when she died in Canada, she received honors in Canada, but not in Colombia. Yes, and it's a shame that, that we have forget, uh, forgotten our authors, authors like him or Ivon America. The other recognized, and here I am bragging again, is Arnoldo Palacios, who was born in Certe Guichoco in 2024 and died in Bogota in 2015. It's a, it was a Colombian writer. Uh, he was very famous in, in Paris because he, he lived in France for a long time. And his most famous book is Las Estrellas Son Negras, The Stars Are Black. And Palacio was recognized for his vivid portrayal of the lives of marginalized communities, and his writing often reflected on his own experiences at the cultural heritage of the Afro-Colombia population. Yes, and by the way, uh, I must mention that this year, finally, the Ministry of, Edu of Culture in Colombia recognized the importance of Arnoldo Palacios and declared this year Arnoldo Palacios year in order to the centenary of his birth. Well, to start closing, I must also recognize that despite the struggle of our Colombian authors to be published, published, read, recognized, and visible, valuable efforts and initiatives have been made to promote their works, such as the Afro-Colombian Literature Book Collection, this collection of 18 books published in 2018. 2010 by the Ministry of Culture of Colombia can be freely downloaded online. Uh, and here you can find novels, short stories, points, and even oral literature from both the Colombian Pacific and the Caribbean coast. The books are in Spanish, of course, except for those by um, indigenous writers like, uh, or rice salt writers like Benito Robinson Ben and Hazel Robinson, which include translation into Creole language. So I mean, well, I, all, I am all the time criticizing, you know me. Yeah, and then uh, even though there, there are not enough works about Afro-Colombian literature, yes, there are some efforts that, that have been, uh, well, doing from 20, 2010 specifically because this collection of books was like a, an, a gate that was open to a new, a reading of the Afro-Colombian literature. So it was very important, this uh, uh, publication, because from this moment, people started uh, reading again. Those authors and new authors were, were interested in publishing their books because they realized that there were people interested in reading them, that it was before this, uh, a collection of books, there were not too much interest in people for reading uh, Afro-descendant writers. And that's a very important point uh, to mention about this collection of books. That, that's why I'm talking about it. And, I'm going, and in this collection, for instance, there is a, a book of Hazel Marie Robinson Abrahams that is one of the author that I'm working in my, my dissertation at this moment. I'm working about Afro, uh, about um, Afro Latin American writers, women writers from Brazil, Colombia, and the Caribbean. And from Colombia, I'm studying uh, Hazel Marie Robinson Abrahams, uh, who's basically a storyteller. And what is important about her that she, 
she tried to change the, the perspective that we have about San Andres, Santa Catalina, and Providence, that people in Colombia just look at San Andres like at the island, the paradise for vacations. Yes, and then because it's the island for vacation, they just go for tourism, and they don't care about what is the history or what is the uh, or what is happening with people in San Andres Island. So what she does is to narrate the the real life of people, the experiences of people in San Andres, and also she put on the map the Creole language. I mean, in Colombia. We speak Spanish. Yes, it's like uh, the official language, but there are 65 indigenous languages. Mm. There is a Romani language, there is a Palenquero language, there is a Creole language, and many people do don't know that we have 68 languages in total in Colombia, mm. in addition to Spanish. So when she writes and she uses Spanish and Creole, mm -hmm. is telling us we are here and we speak another language that is also part of Colombian diversity. Mm -hmm. And it's the same that Miriam Diaz Perez does. She's a palenquero, she's an ethno-educator, bilingual writer. She writes also in palenquero and Spanish language. She's another of the authors I'm studying at this moment. And as well as the other is also an activist. And then you say, why most of writers are also activists? Because we are not only telling stories. We are not writing fiction. We are not just expressing feelings. Mm -hmm. We are expressing, expressing our situations, and our social situation. And also we are putting into, you know, the, the, we are putting the lens, you know, on what is the reality of black people in Colombia or Afro-descendant people in Colombia. Well, uh, well, that's Miriam Diaz Pérez. I'm not going to read uh, her biography because it's too long, and I know that you are tired of listening to me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and well, uh, to sum up, yes, and no more. If I continue mentoring authors, this talk won't ever end. Yes, my pur my purpose was to open the door to the universe of Afro-Colombian literature and their author realities, because nowadays I have noticed that Afro-Latin American studies in the US are giving more attention to the Afro-Latin phenomena connected to the USA. But there are still things happening in Latin America, and we can dismiss them because, just because they don't occur in this territory. Mm -hmm. If we want to embrace a pan-Africanist vision of the world, we need to be more involved with the struggles, but also with the alternatives, creations, and improvements made by our brothers and our sister, whatever they are. Yeah. Ashe. Ashe. Mm. Ashe. I want to, oh, okay, I forgot to play this poem in Palenquero language. You don't have it printed, but it's very easy to understand. Is short. Y hacen da Miriam Díaz y hace di Palengo. Soy Colombia. Y hace africana o colombiana. Y el palengue y el humí. Y hace mandinga y hace bantú. Y el imamubio carabalí. Y hace masai y el imamubio. Y el mozambique tanto tomé. Y hace irinca y el okumí. Y hace yuruba. Well, okay, well, thank you. Ah, <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Let's give her another round of applause. 
Wow, this is a this is very powerful. You know, whenever you learn new information, it just sort of like expands you. You know, like wow. You know, I didn't even know that part was out there. This was a powerful presentation because it gave us another way to look at South America, and particularly Colombia. And I've been to Colombia two or three times, and uh, and I really um, uh, saw a lot and and learned a lot when I was there. And it was just beautiful to end with this poem and this statement where the people just named the different ethnic groups of Africa. I'm Mandinga, I'm Dinka, I'm Yoruba, and so forth. It's very, that is true. That is always the case when we see that the uh, diaspora of the African continent is all over the world. And in fact, I just heard today that there is now a growing African diaspora and those of you who are in Canada, you may know this, in Quebec, because they're, they are, what they are doing, actually, people are actually inviting African miners to come to Quebec to work in the mines. Now, one of the things that this means is that ultimately, in, uh, just as I found out when I was in Moscow, uh, they, the, the Russians were saying what they wanted to do was to bring at least 25,000 Nigerians to Russia every year because part of the problem, as Tukufu Zuberi explained to us, is the low birth rate is going on in Europe. And so wh where, where is their growth rate? The growth rate is in the continent of Africa. So getting Africans and taking Africans to these places, you know, and, uh, you know, we, we have to just worry about exploitation. But, I mean, I think the whole idea, though, is that Africans are everywhere and in Colombia. Now, um, I know you may have some questions, and there may be some comments or questions from, from our live stream. And uh, we'll take uh, a few questions uh, here, and then uh, we will... Um, we will, we will proceed. Go right okay. here. Okay. Um, first question. First of all, your presentation was excellent. Uh, thank you. I apologize for being late. Um, you mentioned that one of the authors, um, I wrote it down, that he introduced to us the Yoruba cosmology. Can you expound on that a little bit? Hi, it's a, uh, Manuel Zapata Oliveira in his book, uh, Chango el Gran Putas, or the um, Chango the Great Badass, I think is the translation. Yes, and what he do, does is like um, epic, you know, like an epic of the Yoruba, and then he starts by um, talking the, the history of, or the story of Chango, and then what was uh, the way he was born, and also was connected with other uh, Orishas, and then in the way that he's narrating the, um, the story of all the, Jor the Yoruba pantheon, he is also connecting with the history of Afro-descendants in Colombia. So I mean, the, the different leaders of uh, revolutions and intellectual heritages in Colombia. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but before that, um, Zapata Oliveira published that book, we didn't know too much about, well, perhaps people who was connected with Yoruba religion or knew about it, but I mean, people who were like me, that I was in literature, I was not very connected with my origins. I learned, uh, I, I learned for the first time about Yoruba religion and about those Orishas when I read uh, Changu el Gran Putas. Good afternoon, my, or good evening. My question is, um, I noticed during the beginning of your presentation or lecture that uh, the population had decreased, I think, in 20, what was it, 2016 or something in comparison to another year. Uh, could you explain the reason for the population decrease? Well, I don't think that the population had decreased in there. In, in, in fact, it's in the numbers. I mean, in the, the figure that official uh, statistics or institutions uh, say, because indeed the population of Afro-Colombian people, I think, well, or I mean, unofficial statistics is around 20%. 
It's 20% of the population really are Afro-descendant. But the, because of the self-recognition in the first census, we had, uh, well, like uh, around 10% of the population who recognized themselves as um, Afro-descendant. But then th there were some changes in the way that peop that government a census population in 2018. I think that there was a, a problem with the budget. There were information that was missing. And also, the, um, it depends on how people recognize themselves. So the information that they got was that people didn't want to recognize themselves as Afro-descendant. And that was the way that the government uh, situated uh, or located this information in the figure, you know, of the of the official figures that they have, the, the official numbers. Yeah, but indeed, there is. I don't think that there is a. In fact, I, I don't think there is a, a, a real um, decrease in the Afro African descendant population in Colombia. Mm -hmm. I, we have an online question. Uh, mm -hmm. Sammy G asks, what do you hope comes from the implementation of Swahili in the schools in Colombia? Oh, well, this is, well, there is a, propose, uh, a proposal made by Francia Marquez and this government. I haven't been in Colombia uh, very much since I'm here studying my PhDs. I mean, I've been out of Colombia. Uh, since this government started, and I, I don't know, I really don't know uh, how this project is it's going on. Yeah, but I, I, I know that the idea with these uh, poli policies is that we have more connection with African countries in order to get, well, I don't know, collaborations, scholarships, or any opportunities for uh, trade or whatever. So, I mean, more active connections with African countries instead of uh, countries from North uh, North America or Europe. That's the, that was the idea, and that's mm -hmm. and and the idea is, is to get that more people travel also for tourism from Colombia to Africa, and that was uh, this idea of teaching Swahili in. In African, in in Colombia, in in Colombian schools, but I I, re I really don't know how this project is going on because I'm unfortunately I I haven't been very connected with the with these political issues in 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 Colombia since I'm trying to survive here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, Yesenia, gracias, loca. Uh, thank you for the presentation, uh, lecture. I was, I was gonna ask you. You said at the beginning that. For example, you pointed out like shows like Narcos and stuff like that, they don't present a lot of, you know, Afro-descendant people. Mm -hmm. I'm asking you like right now, do you think, is there like a show or like a variety of shows that actually present mm -hmm. those lives? Because I do remember uh, on Netflix, I think it was Bruja, the name of one, mm -hmm. that it was, you know, but then I cannot think, now that you pointed that out, I cannot think of like, you know, many Afro-descendant Colombian protagonists and stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, that's, a I'm, I'm all the time having discussion with people in the the different in, uh, how do you say networks? Yes, like a social networks and things like that. Because when when I say that I'm Colombia, the first thing that they say it's you don't speak like a Colombian. I say how that how I'm supposed to speak as a Colombian, and it's because I don't speak like a paisa. I mean, it because it's what, what most people know now about Colombia is because of Pablo Escobar or narco series. Mm -hmm. And then, and that's what the, the, the TV shows, because unfortunately those kinds of series are what sell a lot. Yes, and, and well, you know, TVs are streaming, uh, shows are very famous at this moment and they are interested in, 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 in getting money. Yeah, but there's movies more than series movies because Bruja, it was also a stereotype, you know, a stereotype kind of theory about what we are supposed to be, Brujas, and you know, in the in the colonial time and this kind of stuff. But for instance, Choco, it's a good movie that show you that that show you the the reality of of Colombia. Uh, well, at this moment, I don't have 
in mind all the movies but i can sh i can tell you later because but there are a lot of movies independent movies yes independent producer movies filmmakers who talk a lot about about choco um, and, and about the reality of black people in colombia thank you mm -hmm. thank you very much thank you very much Thank you. You can see that uh, people are very excited about this topic, and yet you got many questions for uh, uh, soon to be hopefully a uh, doctor. But we're just really so happy uh, that uh, Sister Yesenia has given this presentation. I want to just make a couple of uh, points, and the one is the, about the last one. Uh, the, the vice president of Colombia is an Afro-Colombian. And, uh, and she is very progressive in her thinking and her, her ideas. And this notion that Kiswahili should be a part of the learning of the, of the students, of the children, is extremely uh, pan-Africanist. It's a pan-African uh, move on the part of the Colombian government, something that has not happened here. We, have, we don't have a requirement in Pennsylvania that you do Kiswahili or Yoruba or Zulu or any African languages, you see. We don't even, it's hard to even get it in the universities. So the interesting thing about Colombia in doing this is that by making that uh, uh, decision, it has in effect stepped out front of all of the, la of, of the South American countries, even out front of, of Brazil in that regard. And that's a very uh, positive move. And, and Kiswahili, uh, even though it is not a West African language, it is uh, considered perhaps the most accessible African language for people in the diaspora. And in fact, it was proposed in this country in the 1960s by the philosopher Maulana Karenga. He was the one, you know, people know about Kwanzaa, they know about Habari Ghani, you know, Asante Sana. They know about the Harambe. They know about these, these words that come out of the Kiswahili. It's because of Dr. Maulana Karenga in the 1960s proposing that Kiswahili become the, uh, lingua franca, the, 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 the lingua franca for all African people outside of the continent of Africa. And in fact, because, and I think this was a wonderful point that Yesenia was making, because uh, in the African Union, they have declared that Kiswahili should be the continental language of Africa. So now, if it's going to be the continental language of Africa, if you got a country like Colombia or Brazil or the U.S. or Jamaica or Haiti, there's no reason why we should not also be studying Kiswahili. And in fact, we should probably be teaching it here at the MKA Institute. But, and, and that's something that we, we need to think about. So this is, that's one point. The second thing I wanted to say is that um, I was very happy, and I t I've said this to uh, Yesenia before, uh, about Manuel uh, Zapata Oliveira because he was the first uh, Afro-Colombian I met, and I met him in in the nineteen uh, uh, late in the late seventies in Buffalo, New York, because he was a visiting professor uh, at this university where I was teaching, and he was a good friend to Abdias do Nascimento, who was a Brazilian, and they they were both really uh, really uh, uh, good good people for me to know at that time. And, um, and, uh, and I, um, the last time I saw him in 2004, um, he, uh, uh, that's the year he, of his death, in 2004, we were at the, um, the Conference of African Intellectuals that was being held in Dakar, Senegal. And actually, we rode to the airport together. And I will never forget that... Um, uh, uh, Zapata at that conference gave a very, he was very impassioned and a very emotional uh, speaker, gave a very powerful uh, presentation on the plight of the people in Colombia, the Africans in Colombia. And that brings me to the last point I want to make about the reduction in the numbers. Uh, it's very interesting, uh, uh, Sister Yesenia, because in the U.S. we have the same 
we have similar situations with the politics of the census. Uh, for a long time, for example, uh, in this country, actually, uh, in this country, uh, at the very beginning of the census in 1790, and then afterwards, the census has always been used politically. Uh, the, the, uh, in the 1960s, uh, the, the country decided that people of Mexican heritage uh, would become um, whites. So, so now you have a situation where the white population expands but it expands by virtue of a reclassification of Mexicans as white, you see. So this is a, and then of course, over the years, this, this, this um, population of Africans uh, uh, may very well have uh, uh, also uh, d decreased by self-identification. People simply say, well, you know, I'm not uh, uh, African descendant, I'm mixed. And to say you are mixed doesn't mean that you don't have African descendants. It means that you have just reclassified yourself in your own mind that you're not going to you're not going to check when it says African or black. You you're going to check some other box. You see, so it's a political thing. It's also the same thing with uh, uh, in this country. And I wrote about this uh, maybe a couple of years ago with the um, the Office of Management and Budget uh, declared that if you were born in Africa. But if you were born in North Africa, you were not an African, and that you were white. So this was a, a classification system for the American government. And of course, we've been fighting that since that time. That, that's, that's really crazy. We had a, a wonderful young man uh, from Egypt uh, who was born in Egypt, uh, but, of, uh, but considered himself of African descent. And he had to sue the American government to, to, for them to change his classification. He said, because they wrote on there white. He said, I'm not white. That's not, that's not me. But, but the U.S. government declares if you're born in North Africa, uh, you can't put down African or black, even if you are black. So it's a whole, it's, it, it is a political issue. And so to see this notion of the reduction of the population, the black population, she's right. It's not the reduction in the numbers, the absolute numbers. The reduction is, is, is a whole idea that's going on in people's heads. And this is, a, and, is and, and the opposite, by the way, is happening in Brazil. In Brazil, and I'll be finished with this, in Brazil, um, the government decided a few years ago uh, that they would do uh, quotas and that if you are of African descent, you can go to the university system for free and that they could, they would create a system, an affirmative action program for people who were Afro uh, descendants. And the reason they would do this is because for hundreds of years, African people have been kept out of the universities. So they, they moved into, this was under Lula's first government, and they said, okay, no, we're going to open this system up. At least 50% of all the people who go into the universities ought to be uh, African people of African descent. So what did that do? That increased the number of Africans in Brazil because there were those people who, were, who, who had seen themselves as whites who declared, well, I'm of African descent. I got a great-grandfather who was an African, you see. And so they also were, were able to get under that, uh, I into the universities under that. So these things are political, and they are dis dependent on how people uh, view themselves and how the society views themselves. Thank you so much, and I want to thank, uh, you know, publicly uh, one of the great fighters and, and academics uh, that I know of, Dr. Aaron Smith, Dr. Jabali Ade. He's a really um, great guy, and, uh, and, and he and I, we, we have a book coming out of the SUNY State University of New York Press, which is uh, uh, on reading uh, W.B. Du Bois, Afrocentrically, and we're discussing the color line. And we, we're hoping that that will be coming out soon. But uh, he, is, um, he is also just really doing a really wonderful job uh, at the university, but is, like a lot of us, uh, under assault and attack. But uh, we, we, we're fighting the good fight. I want to thank all of you for supporting him, me, uh, us, and everybody, and, and supporting the MKA Institute. We want to thank also Brother Kareem. 
Uh, he has really helped us a lot uh, technically, and also our board members who are here. We want to thank them. Appreciate uh, uh, Brother Stan, Brother Carlton, uh, Sister Belinda, and everybody else. All right. So um, uh, we call upon our ancestors always. We call upon our ancestors far and near, the mother of our mothers, the father of our fathers, to always render mercy and to bear witness for the liberation and the victory of all oppressed people forever. It is done. Ashe. All right. Thank you all very much for coming.